I'm Margaret Lee, and today I'm here to tell you a little bit about my time at Google, all 14 and a half years, but I'm going to rush through it because I got a late start. I'm going to touch on the evolution of UX and how that led to the role that I had before leaving just earlier this month to pursue leadership coaching. I started the UX community and culture program five years ago, right as I joined the community garden in my neighborhood. And what I learned about growing things was actually remarkably similar to what it takes to cultivate a healthy culture and a thriving community. Gardens and culture are both living and dynamic phenomena that require us to be really mindful and adaptive to ever-shifting conditions. So culture is defined as the shared values, beliefs, and practices that characterize a community and how all that gets expressed. And community, in turn, is made up of those connected by values, beliefs, and practices. It's our sense of shared fellowship. And they're intertwined, and they naturally exist in every organization. And my team's mission was to create the conditions for culture to thrive so that the community might better connect. And the size and sprawl of Google added to this challenge but really, scale is simply one factor. All these lessons can really be applied to organizations of any size. So this role was not something that I had planned on doing, nor did it even exist at the time. I had been considering a sabbatical or possibly leaving Google altogether five years ago. I wasn't really sure. I just knew I needed some kind of a change. And in anticipation of having more time on my hands, I ended up joining my community garden. But instead of putting my career to bed, I ended up laying the seeds for renewal. So I want to give you a little flashback, a bit of historical context. When I joined Google in March of 2007, UX was still a relatively nascent function. This is a picture of our first UX offsite right around when I joined. There were about 120 of us. We were still centralized, and we could really move fluidly from project to project. We were kind of like our own free agents. Many of us were designers who coded and researchers who basically conducted late-stage usability. And this was because we were building relatively simple web UIs at that time. It really felt like a small town where everyone more or less knew one another, and we could collaborate really easily across projects. I ended up in Google Maps, which in early 2007 was still a distant third to Yahoo Maps and MapQuest. These were really early days, before the smartphone even. The first iPhone was still months away from being released, and the first Android was still maybe a year away from that. And half of all the internet users in the States were still on dial-up. We were basically building for the web on desktop and optimizing for speed and utility. But over the course of the following nine years, I would build my team from just a couple of 20% designers to the full stack global team that would help make Google Maps first in its class. It was truly amazing to be part of shaping this team, our design process, and of course, the product itself. And a similar transformation was happening across the entire UX org at Google. That centralized kind of free agent model of yesteryear wasn't scaling. So we ended up decentralizing. And UX got embedded into business units. And being embedded enabled UX to develop deep domain expertise and to establish relationships with our cross-functional partners, and that was positive. But the downside was there was less sharing and cross-pollination of ideas across teams because we became much more siloed. And our work also became far more complex with many more products, apps, and platforms to design for, well beyond the web and desktop era of before. So we had to define and hire new roles that we simply take for granted today, like specialized designers without CS degrees, quant and qual research that went beyond usability, and roles like content strategists, UX engineers, program managers that we didn't have before. And we grew rapidly into the thousands around the world. And all this change and growth were absolutely necessary and good, because we had to keep pace with 
you know, ever-evolving technology and consumer expectations that simply kept getting more sophisticated. But the unintended effect was a weakening of connections within our community. We could start to feel the cracks in our culture. And by 2016, I was nine years into this evolution. And I, I loved my team, and I really loved working on Google Maps. But nine years is a really long time in tech. I mean, I was like 60 dog years into it. And I felt ready to hand the baton to somebody else who might bring it some fresh energy. But I just wanted to make sure that the transition would, would be smooth and painless. So I gave my boss, Bobby, a pretty long heads up, like a few months in advance, because I didn't have another thing I was going to, but I just knew I wanted to make a change, and I, I wanted to do this right, because I knew it would take time to recruit, hire, and onboard a new leader onto an established team and a product. So Bobby and I were commiserating about the, the challenges of this type of leadership and org change, which is essentially an experienced design problem with a lot of issues tending to fall between the cracks of organizational accountability. And I joked with him, oh, for crying out loud, I could fix that problem. And he kind of like looked at me sideways and he said, actually, that's not such a crazy idea. And I was like, darn, I was this close to, to, to leaving. But, you know, he had a point. I did have a lot of firsthand experience building and running a big UX org within Google, and I understood what that took. And I had also spent a lot of my 20% time on things like improving UX processes. And over the course of those nine years, I became deeply, deeply familiar with many of these types of issues that lay beneath the surface and fall between the cracks. And I kind of knew how to work around that. And I felt kind of intrigued by this possibility. I mean, Bobby was right. Maybe it wasn't such a crazy idea. I mean, why not have someone from UX dedicated to creating a better experience for being in UX? And that's how the seed for UXCC, UX Community and Culture, was planted. So once an idea is planted, how do you get it to take root and grow? I thought about the words of another longtime leader at Google who said, I am at the phase in my career where service to our company and service to you is the thing that gets me out of bed every day. And that really resonated with me. And I thought, well, maybe this is the type of change that I'm looking for. And I realized I didn't have to leave Google to find that. I realized, you know, I do want to sow my experience back into the culture to make it better. But first I had to define, like, what does that even look like? So I wrote a proposal and shopped it around. I socialized my proposal to get feedback and buy-in because it was really important that I get buy-in from fellow UX leaders across Google. Because remember, by this time, we were decentralized. So each of the big business units had you know, their own leaders and their own organizations. And this proposal would not fly if it were perceived as like, oh, it's Mar Margaret's pet project or something versus a program that was truly in service of the entire UX organization at large. I had to be really sensitive to those types of potential optics. But it turned out it really wasn't such a hard sell because many of these leaders just readily agreed that, yeah, we have a lot of challenges, and yes, we have a lot of opportunities to fix it, and we trust you to do that. So in the course of you know, shopping this around, I, I was also able to get a bit of tin cup funding from these leaders out of their budgets and a commitment for two additional um, individuals who were interested in joining the team. So with that, two other people and a little bit of funding, we were greenlit for UXCC. But there was really no precedent for what we were trying to do. No one was really accountable to us, and we weren't part of anyone's roadmaps. We had a lot of ambition and a lot of ideas, but we had very few resources. Basically, we had ourselves, and the only other currency that we had was our personal understanding and experience of the culture and our personal networks, which actually is worth quite a lot. So we went about surveying the land to, to basically understand, like, what are, you know, what are the conditions that we're working with? What, what's the environment like? And we looked for, you know, the perennial needs, like hiring that happen year-round, and the seasonal ones, like performance review time and roadmap planning that might happen once or twice a year, which together kind of form this underlying cadence for UX activity. And then we looked at, you know, what aspects of UX are thriving and what needs a little bit of a boost. And given our limited resources, where should we 
where should we invest? So we determined that we wanted to preserve the open exchange of ideas that was the real hallmark of the earlier years when we were much smaller, but which got far more difficult in the face of these deepening organizational silos. And with just three of us, we wanted to feed promising partnerships as a way to scale and tackle issues that had a lot of shared pain points across organizations. An example was the hiring process, which really no one was happy with at all. Like hiring managers weren't happy with the pipeline, staffing team wasn't happy with the you know, slow pace of getting interview feedback back from UX, not to mention the poor candidates who found it all too lengthy and a bit of a black box. And we knew we could only improve this by working together so that we could address all the moving parts between staffing and UX to reduce the time to hire and improve the overall candidate experience. And we wanted to weed out things that no longer worked because there were so many processes that were basically holdovers that were designed long time ago by engineers and for engineers when the company was a lot smaller. So we began to rethink you know, some UX-specific processes like onboarding so that it could be more relevant to UX and that we, we didn't have to take perforce training when you joined you know, as a UXer. So as your org evolves, know what's core to your company's DNA and what might be mutable. And recognize when your team has outgrown a process because often things will just stay broken because of inertia or because there's no clear owner. But once someone initiates change, momentum can build and change can happen. So in the garden, the soil is our foundation. And if the soil isn't healthy, little is going to grow. So how could we know if the UX foundation was healthy? Well, we knew that there was a ton of valuable data and insights in Google Geist, which is our company's annual pulse survey. The problem was that the data was sliced only along reporting lines, and since UX is you know, embedded within silos, there was no company-wide view of UX, and we would have to like, obtain all these different slices and surgically remove just the UX pieces to get that company-wide view. In fact, you know, th there was no holistic view of UX um, that had happened since we had decentralized probably about six years prior. And we felt that we really needed this cut of data to, to understand like, what the baseline of our health was. And uh, we thought, well, how are we going to get this data? It doesn't even exist in this, this form. So we tapped the only currency that we had, which was our network, and we found one single ally in HR who believed in our mission. And with that, we got the data. And we got the, the baseline of UX health. We were able to make the case for in investment in a number of our programs. And the precedent was set. So from there on out, um, UXCC got that data, and we provide the, provided the analysis every year since. And that was a really important lesson for us. Don't assume that something can't be done just because no one had done it yet. No one was going to grant us the authority by default. We had to leverage persuasion and influence. And as a small group serving a disproportionately large community, developing influence meant constantly exploring what else is out there, you know, to read the room or really to read the ecosystem to see who else is buzzing around. We had to make sense of an ecosystem that was in constant flux, you know, one of, you know, ever-shifting priorities and more than occasional reorgs. We needed to get out there and socialize what UXCC was about because we were really new and nobody knew of us yet. So we first introduced ourselves and our intention to the UX community at large, and we chose our annual UXU conference as the platform for that because of its high visibility and attendance. And our introduction was framed as kind of like a strategic narrative, which looked back at our roots, gave us a sense of appreciation for how far we had come, and how this new group, UXCC, could support our community in writing its next chapter. And we followed up in the you know, next few weeks with roadshows so that we could talk to managers and their teams to get a better understanding of their needs within their business units. And then I engaged senior stakeholders to lend us relevance and representation. I brought together eight other UX executives from across the company, all the senior most you know, VPs and senior directors from different business units, to create a leadership council, which acts acted as our board of directors. 
So it, it lent legitimacy to UXCC in the you know, eyes of Google, even beyond UX. It gave us critical guidance from within the business units, and it really was something to hold us accountable. And then we socialized with teams outside of UX because we need the cooperation of all these other support functions that basically hold the keys to our ability to run well as an organization. So open up your networks beyond the obvious, because there's a lot of problems that tend to fall between the cracks and have no clear owners, but that doesn't mean that they can't be solved with the right partnerships. And then we took stock of what already existed to see what we had to work with. So when new company policies and processes are introduced, it warrants an intentional approach to change management. Things like you know, policies around hiring, job ladders, promotion, or learning and development, they all have owners outside of UX, usually in kind of like the people operations, HR type functions. But they, they really do require knowledgeable representatives from the business, namely like UX or whatever function, to inform them because we're essentially their clients. And before UXCC existed, um, teams like HR, they had no single point of contact to turn to. So we found that being consistently involved in change management really let us proactively shape these policies rather than just kind of like accept them as they are or just be left reacting to them. And then we looked at the established rituals that you know, we could see were really important to the community, like UX University and sprint training. These were popular efforts that grew organically over the years, and despite their obvious value and, and great potential, neither had any home. They were sustained purely on 20% time and 10 cup donations. So we identified those as like really great things to provide a stable home for and to invest in. And then there were hundreds, hundreds of volunteers that would drive you know, smaller events and create many resources in their 20% time. And we were eager to capitalize on their ideas and especially their passion, because without volunteers, there would be no programs. So we clearly had plenty of material to work with, proving that culture change doesn't have to be expensive and resource intensive. I took a cue from my time in Google Maps when I would watch the hardware engineers basically prototype the next-gen Street View cameras using off-the-shelf components from places like Radio Shack. They didn't need to invent everything from scratch. They could innovate quickly using what was readily available. And in a similar vein, we built upon a lot of existing programs from around the company and remixed, reimagined, or sequenced them differently to create something new and holistic. And the themes that emerged from our audit were career development, knowledge sharing, and community engagement. And I'll touch upon each of those. So UX isn't a monolith. We vary in experience, discipline, and tenure. And it's really important to meet people where they are when it comes to their development. We looked at the collective stages of this career journey as kind of like a, you know, as a, as a, as a user journey. Um, from higher education to entering the workforce to growing as a practitioner and then developing as a leader. Every program along the way involved the community as both beneficiaries but also as contributors and sponsors. Folks would you know, host interns, sponsor the student projects, participate on hiring and promotion committees, teach classes, and mentor others. Volunteers were so critical to the success of these programs that we ended up building in a citizenship expectation into the job ladders. And this acknowledges the work is really important enough to be acknowledged in one's performance review, but it also created a virtuous cycle by encouraging the community to constantly kind of give back to itself. And you can imagine that with thousands of UXers of different experiences, that there would be a wealth of knowledge to unlock. So our goal was to basically connect the folks who have expertise to those who could benefit from it. And we did this in a, a number of ways. We sponsored training and development on emerging areas like designing with machine learning, as well as influence skills, which are always really important. Um, things like you know, presenting to executives or navigating complexity, of which Google has absolutely no shortage of. 
And all these classes and trainings were developed and taught by other members of the community. And because, you know, UXCC is never going to be big or knowledgeable enough to know everything that's worth knowing. But the community, on the other hand, is an endless source of knowledge. So we created frameworks so that the community could contribute and build upon it. For example, I did this with a, a new UX manager handbook. I authored a few topics. I outlined a, and suggested a few categories. And then we open sourced it so that other UX managers could author topics on an ongoing basis. And we shared insights from our company Pulse survey that I mentioned earlier, Google Geist. The holistic view of UX really helped leaders from across the company to calibrate how their organization was faring relative to the whole. And having a common baseline acted as like a multiplier effect for awareness, but also for proposed solutions. Because leaders started to share their best practices for addressing the low scoring items that they were seeing and started to band together to solve issues across organizations. And as we became more separated by you know, organizational constructs, geography, and then more lately working from home, fostering community became increasingly important. UX is incredibly generous you know, in spirit, but also incredibly busy in practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So we aim to make it easier for people to come together and to learn from one another and to feel part of the larger community. We supported a variety of summits and gatherings, from the annual UX University for thousands in the org to smaller regional and functional events that were more targeted and intimate. And all these events generated ton of energy and also social capital that would carry well beyond the events themselves, making it much more likely and natural for people to reach across their org lines and collaborate on shared product initiatives. And we curated regular forums to keep managers and leaders up to date on important information from across the company that often can fall victim to information overload in their inboxes. And every UX function took a cue from the leadership council that I formed earlier to form their own steering committees to look after the specific needs of their group or their region. And these committees became really important collaborators for my team because their depth of knowledge really complemented our breadth of coverage. And we also went beyond our own backyard to, have, you know, to take part in the external community as well. On the education front, we worked with schools like the Savannah College of Art and Design to sponsor student projects and influence the curriculum so that graduates would be better prepared to enter the workforce. And to support diversity, equity, and inclusion, we sponsored events like the Design and Diversity Conference and funded um, diversity scholarships for women's leadership programs. And we seeded dialogue on what we felt were really important industry topics like designing for user trust or diversifying leadership. And we did this by connecting UXers with speaking opportunities at external conferences and by publishing thought pieces on design.google.com. So this has been an incredibly fruitful five years leading UXCC while tending to my garden. And over that time, my team grew from three to I think over 20 by the time I left three weeks ago. <laughs> And we went from a tin cup funding model to a bona fide budget and a cost center. I mean, we really became actually legitimate. So I want to share a few final lessons from the garden and my work at Google. First, focus on building that healthy foundation. When I joined my garden, I inherited an incredibly fertile plot. And I, with very little effort, I was like reaping cornucopia week after week. And I thought, wow. I'm a beginner, but apparently I'm a total natural at this. But the following season, just a few scraggly plants grew. I maybe got three tomatoes. It turned out I had been living off the goodwill of the prior gardener of my plot, who was lit literally a certified master gardener. And I had depleted that goodwill. I hadn't known that I needed to feed the soil and to reinvest. Well, the same goes for community and culture. Our foundation isn't like a slab of concrete that you pour once and forget. Um, my, my screen just went black. If somebody could maybe pull that back up, thanks. Um, it's really important to uh, reinvest 
back into your foundation. You know, you need to look beneath the surface for good structure. You know, see, does it hold water? Is it healthy? Do you need to feed it? Do you need to reinvest for future seasons of growth? It's also really important to rotate your crops to get a healthy yield, because if you plant the same thing in the same place year after year, it depletes the soil of its nutrients. It becomes a monoculture. And soil needs biodiversity to be healthy. So we took the same approach with our programs. For example, we kept our annual manager summit fresh by changing the location every year, and it was never in Mountain View. Um, this was obviously when we could come together in person. And uh, we also would get new contributors. And of course, last year, we designed a new format. And in nature, volunteer plants will sprout in different locations as seeds are scattered by the birds and winds. Likewise, ideas and programs can spread and take root elsewhere, thanks to pollinators. So as our annual conference, UXU, got bigger, teams in Europe and Asia proposed doing their own regional versions. And at first, we were like really nervous and nail-bitey about it because we were afraid to lose control. But thankfully, you know, we came to our senses because honestly, passion like, like what the volunteers in the regions wanted to do is something that you want to water, not weed out. The volunteers in these regions did a far better job than we could have understanding the, the needs of their region. And we ended up actually taking some of their ideas and folding it back into the main event. And that's a really good reminder that this work is far less about doing it all and much more about enabling the community to create their own stories. So take the mindset to nudge the system so that you can catalyze momentum. And don't be precious. You know, be willing to experiment, iterate, and toss what doesn't work. Accept that some ideas are just going to take longer to flower. And be flexible with how you want to get there. For example, I knew that I wanted to invest in our L7s, which is the level right before director level, because that pulse survey showed red flags for that population year over year. But developing a targeted program for just this population required aligning a lot of different parties who had their own existing agendas. So instead of pushing this boulder uphill, I broke the, this into smaller components and framed them as, as experiments. And that gave us quick insight into what was and wasn't working, allowed us to build this over time, and course correct along the way. Boiling the ocean is just too unwieldy when you're faced with complex conditions. So start small and feel free to experiment, because it can yield a series of small wins that will yield something bigger down the road. And by the way, it did take us a couple years, but we did create enough momentum to, to launch our leadership development program for L7s last year, and it's in its third cohort right now. And embrace influence over authority, because culture and community will exist with or without our intervention. We can't mandate culture to be healthy, but we can influence it in the right direction and provide the conditions for it to thrive. And think about success differently, because culture is really hard to measure and to attribute to any one thing. Fostering a healthy culture is a long game, if not an infinite quest. So whether or not we have stated metrics, we usually have goals that can guide us. Someone wise once said, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that be counted counts. But for me, this has all counted an awful lot because I've always been someone that's been more comfortable leading from behind and through others. And this work has been the ultimate expression of that. I got to lead the community to lead itself. And thanks to my boss and his crazy idea, I was able to turn a near resignation into an incredibly fulfilling role. So you never know what seeds of change are germinating beneath the surface, how you might grow and how you might help your community to thrive in the process. So be open to the possibilities of the seasons ahead. Thank you. Wonderful. So we have time for a few questions here. Let's go sit over here. Um, so, Lauren um, has the question, what uh, methods did you find useful for preserving the open exchange of ideas across different UX teams? It really was 
uh, finding ways to connect the people that had ideas that they wanted to share with people who likely would benefit from it. And like I said, I outlined a few of them, but really it was just like, how do you make it easy for people to step away from their day to day so that they could do this? Because people will optimize for what's in front of them. And usually that's like, you know, whatever their business vertical has assigned, right? The, the OK, the objectives, key results or whatever. Um, and, you know, I think underlying a lot of this is this, is this um, hypothesis that UX is a function that generally tries to make a coherent experience, and that does mean you need to kind of cross org lines to do that. So I think UX was actually um, generally willing, in, like I said, generally willing in theory, but it was like we had to just make it easier. So it was just through these, you know, creation of events that made it really easy for people to sign up with. But we also had to socialize the ideas so that managers would um, green light people taking time off to attend these events. And generally, if they were also taking part as speakers and, and instructors, that also helped because it was furthering the cause of usually that business unit. Awesome. Yeah. Um, one other question is what, uh, let's see here, how would you recommend starting to build something similar when you have a much smaller UX team? I would, I would start by seeing who your you know, pollinators are, who, who are your enthusiastic volunteers, because honestly, that was, that was so important for us to just first understand, like, what can we do based on how many resources we could help um, you know, actually execute these programs. And they're all volunteers, because when you're a small team, you have to have a lot of volunteers. Fortunately, there's so many passionate people out there that are always willing to do something, right? And if you just identify like, okay, what's your passion? What's your passion? What's your passion? You put together your dream team of people who will cover the bases. That's, that's how I would do it. I would just identify volunteers. And those would be within the UX team or those could be outside of the they, UX they team? They could be outside the UX team too. Like I said, we, we did a lot of partnerships with other parts of the Google organization who you know, had their half of the pain point that we were also trying to solve. So they were always, like staffing was always willing to help us sponsor events. You know, and they'd, they would always, you know, be there just as volunteers even. So, um, yeah, I, I know that that doesn't help with, like, if you're a super small team and you can only get so many volunteers, but potentially even the external community, if it's, if it's something that you're doing that's open outside. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, so one last question. How did you, Jeff asks, how did you find out the baseline of UX health? Was it an internal survey of UX employees or some other method? So it was that annual company pulse survey that I had mentioned called Google Geist. Every single employee at Google, it's not just a UX survey, um, takes part in that annual survey and then the data is sliced and, and provided. So it was that. I had to we had to get a slice that covered just UX, and that didn't exist before our team you know, uh, came to be, and we had to basically lobby for it. But that, that was the thing that we really, really needed. And it's the thing that helps with that, it's, it's already the lingua franca that the company uses. Everyone looks at Google, Google Guys data, so the fact that we were using the same data that everyone else was using was super, super helpful. Wonderful. So let's give uh, Margaret another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you.